today um, we're going to be talking to, um, well, talking to you lot out there. <laughs> so I was just, just going to do a quick introduction and it's, my name's Alan Chamberlain. I'm, I'm going to let Dave um, introduce himself first. Hi, oh, yes, yeah, so I'm Dave Durer, uh, based at the University of Oxford, um, also at the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK National Institute for Data Science and AI. And actually my research there is on AI and music. And I also work with PRISM, the uh, Centre for Practice and Research in Science and Music at the Royal Northern College of Music. So my name's Alan Chamberlain. I'm a Senior Research Fellow in the Mixed Reality Lab, and I'm a Honorary Fellow in the Department of Music at University of Nottingham. And I've done some work with Dave in the past, worked on a project called FAST, and I've got a couple of other projects that are based around, um, one with Dave, actually, on... Um, sound art and the internet of things uh, funded by Petrus and um, uh, another project which is based around trying to start to unpack some of the issues around understanding AI and music. So um, today, uh, well, I hope this is going to be of interest to everybody. Well, I know it is. Um, there, there are a few things that we're going to be talking about. Um, th this is more of a a conversation stroke lecture that we're going to be having. Um, Dave's going to be sharing some slides. We'll put in some links to music and links to other interesting things that are happening so people can go away and look at that. Um, so we'll be talking about issues around computational creativity, um, the experimental digital humanities, um, the human in the loop, AI, I guess, um, compositional practice in a, in a rather abstract way um is there anything else dave that i've missed there are probably loads of things that i've missed that are going to pop up uh I'm, I've, that certainly is where we're starting it would be exciting, <laughs> exciting to see where we end up <laughs> yeah these things often often emerge as you um hmm. as you discuss these things but um I, I think as a starting point um um in an earlier discussion oh, we were chatting to dave and he was going to perhaps start with um, reflecting on, on some work that we'd done or that he'd actually started based around Ada Lovelace. Sure. I'm going to share a, a picture of Ada Lovelace. Obviously. There we are. I've, probably people have heard of Ada Lovelace and um, she has a very important role today as a, an icon of, of women in computing. Um, and she's, she's held up as um, you know, one of the first Women programmers, one of the first people to write a program. And the, the computer in question was Charles Babbage's analytical engine, which uh, is actually remains a hypothetical engine. Here's an artist's impression from Sydney Padua. It's a fast steam powered mechanical com computing device, which interestingly has a, a lot about it, which is similar to the architectures of computers we use today. Now, we, we could discuss that role of, of Ada Lovelace, but I think the really significant thing I wanted to mention here is while Babbage and others were thinking about crunching numbers, uh, you know, building log tables uh, in order to help with engineering and so on, um, Lovelace was asking questions about can, what, what about computers creating music and yeah. can computers be creative? So she was interdisciplinary. She was actually a musician. People forget this. So when she's held up as a STEM icon, she really should be a STEAM icon, like this picture. <laughs> and uh, some of the things she wrote, which were in um, the um, sort of footnotes to a translation she was doing of a, a talk by Babbage about the analytical engine, um, are very important quotes that, that people still use today. This is the music one. Supposing, for instance, that the fundamental relations of pitch sounds in the science of harmony and music and composition is susceptible of such expression and adaptations, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. Now, this is an important uh, early quote. It's you can see it quite often. We can have long, interesting discussions about what elaborate and scientific pieces of music might be. Uh, but it's definitely about the computer in 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 the process of of, of of creation of music, and then the other thing in her very extensive notes, uh, which she observes, and things like there are several quotes around this. This is just one of them. Um, 
is when she said the analytical engine has no pretensions to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. It can follow analysis, but has no power of anticipating any analytical relations or truths. Its province is to assist us in making available what we're already acquainted with. That's one view. Uh, you can find some other um, statements about this, but this is much discussed, including by Turing. Um, and uh, in, in particular by Margaret Bowden, who, who created the Lovelace questions, which kind of tease apart various aspects uh, of, um, of creativity in computers, of, as Alan said, of computational creativity. And by that, I'm referring to, I choose my words carefully, computers doing things that would require creativity in humans. But it's very much that world of, it's the world of the Turing test. It's that world of, can you tell the difference? Was this piece of music created by a human or by a machine? I'll just come out of the sharing there. So that's, you know, back in the 1800s, that's 1843, those quotes, um, that, that, uh, that discussion uh, commenced. And um, back in 2015, we had a, um, a celebration of the 200th anniversary of the birth of Ada Lovelace uh, at a two-day symposium in Oxford. Uh, and I had the, the, the privilege of um, uh, as being the organiser responsible for music. So we went back to Lovelace's quote. I discussed it with colleagues uh, in the sort of digital computational musicology world. And um, everyone said, well, obviously what I should do is go away and use an emulator of the analytical engine and generate some music. So that's what I did. And we did it with um, the mathematics of the 19th century. Um, and obviously lots of things that were going on in maths in the 19th century uh, are still with us today. But lots of things we do today weren't around then. So I, we worked with some mathematicians to, to figure that out uh, and created some music and then put that on the web it is a tool that anyone could use. So it's called Numbers Into Notes, numbersintonotes.net. And you can choose algorithms, you can generate music. There's a human in the loop aspect to this. I said generate music, generate fragments of music. Yeah. There's a human in the, the loop aspect to this, which is, um, it's a bit like an ink block test. What we would do is, Lay out, we do a mapping from the numbers coming out of a numerical sequence into notes. We play that people, and then they choose the bits in that that they wanted. And we'd isolate those fragments and then they could assemble those fragments. And then Alan, you you took this and uh, you turned yeah, it into I, a social machine. <laughs> yeah, well, there, there are a few bits to this, really. I mean, I, I I kind of knew what you were doing, but I'm I'm always a bit um not suspicious, but lots of people talk about things like AI and computational creativity, and there's <clears throat> there's, there's there's lots of stuff uh, that's well, I don't know that 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 makes you want want to get hold of these tools so you can play with them and experiment with them to see what you can actually do. And I'd, I'd come across your stuff, Dave, and I was quite surprised when you said uh, when I said, "Well, is there a tool that I can use?" And you went, "Yeah, it's online." So, <laughs> so I was like, "Wow, this is like." somebody who's actually um, doing stuff and creating it for normal people to use that, that are not um, advanced programmers or anything. And um, obviously I, I do understand programming, but what, what I wanted to do was um, after reading those quotes that Dave put up, I'd, I, I was really interested in the way that you've got somebody like Ada Lovelace almost, um, I suppose, hypothesizing or, 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 or I certainly mirrored um, ideas of contemporary technology onto that, such as sequences and, and and things that can automatically generate note sequences and sounds and all that kind of stuff. And I was really interested in um, looking at the mechanics of that machine and the noise that it might make, because that, that's what that quote kind of meant to me as well. Imag imagine that it's taken the mu music theory and right composing stuff, but also the sounds that will come out of machines that might be able to use in a musical way. So, so I, I, I played um, around, I use that in quite a, um, in, in a quite a loose way with, with some of the software that Dave had written. And I, and I had this idea about, could I get a series of people to send me sequences that they'd also made uh, using this technology? So what I did, it, it was kind of like a crowdsourcing digital humanities experiment. And um, Dave always uses the term um, experimental digital humanities. And I, I 
interpret that as um, in the way that you get experimental archaeology, where you go and you, you use tools or you experiment with the way that people might have done stuff in order to understand what they were doing and how they did it. So I thought, wow, this, this is great. I, I can use some of Dave's software. I can get other people to use it. I can then see if I can then be that human in the loop. Because I, I believe in that some of the old Ada Lovelace writings, there was this person, the controller, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I became the controller, the, the orchestrator, um, if, if, which is quite an apt term, really, whereas I sent out to people and said, can you send me in interesting things that you've made on this? Um, I'll put some of my own work in, and then I've got the job of pulling all those things together to compose something. Um, and also, I use some field recordings um, that I'm collecting. It's quite nice because... Um, um, in terms of bell ringing, there's also these patterns that people follow. Yeah, it's group uh, theories, capitology. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can get you can get books and books of these patterns. It looks very, very similar to the old like jacquard loom um, or punch card um, systems that used to control computers. So I thought, wow, this this is great, and I'll do that, and I'll get somebody to I'll do some recordings, and I'll pull it all together. And and I think at the time. Um, I know that Adrian's in the, in the lecture now with you now. I think Adrian thought it was going to be a bit beepy. Um, <laughs> but, but, but we pulled it all together. And um, Dave and I um, were at Oxford House um, in um, Bethnal Green. And we, we did a little performance for about an hour. It, it, was, it was an interesting thing to do because what it... Um, oh, look, there, there, there we are. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think we were feeling good because we just had some food and... Um, our setup time was much quicker than other people's. Um, <laughs> yeah, so so what what we were able to do by doing this was um, we started to experiment more and more, I suppose, in a performative way. We we were thinking about I'd certainly I was using Ableton Live and I'd got all these samples um, and sequences in place. I was I was navigating through them, pulling them together to try and create something that was that was going to be listenable and interesting to the audience and trying to keep that within eight minutes and also there are all these what i was trying to do is push it a bit so I, I knew what the samples were i knew what the sequences were but i'd not put them together in any order so for me there was a little bit of that kind of i don't know it, it, it's good to be on edge a little bit to get a, a bit of nervousness because you're, you're on the verge of doing something and to be honest it could have all collapsed and been absolutely dreadful but it didn't it worked really really well and i i certainly know with that piece that that um that i did um i think then i think you you showed it at the turing institute not turing institute at tate modern that's right yeah yeah yeah, yeah so that that kind of got another airing at tape at tate and then it's been used numerous times hasn't it as an example of, of what could be done and what could be made. You, may, you mentioned experimental humanities, and there's, there's an interesting aspect of that because, um, in a way, that's, I think that's what we were doing with the numbers into notes work, in the sense that um, um, we didn't exactly know what Ada Lovelace had, had meant by those quotes. Um, we could study the period, we could study the literature, we could study Babbage's design, and so on. Uh, and in a way, what we were doing was a creative response to that but in 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 humanities there's this this notion of of close reading so we could we could study those words in the footnotes in that book very very closely or we can build it yeah, <laughs> and yeah. and my claim would be we get insights into the process um through the act of of constructing it and we have a phrase for this digital uh, close reading by digital prototyping it could be in software it could be in hardware yeah um and that's a phrase that um we've used in papers with our colleague pip wilcox um, who's helping us with this work yeah yeah so i mean for, for me one of the things that they did i was sort of as, as somebody who worked in um in, in a research lab i was also interested in how you could use this this sort of work to start to think about issues of trust and is are the tools that you're producing do they kind of form a platform for more instrumental works what can i how can i use it how can i you know, destroy it, how can I? But but what was really good about this was um, 
it, it was it started to I, th I think Dave is probably the same opinion it starts to kind of unpack the hu the, the, the role that the human plays more in these sorts of systems and it is kind of obvious in a way when you look at people playing with the synthesizers and I know that there's a vogue at the moment for for modular synths and and that kind of stuff but but really they're the people who are sort of plugging and unplugging and altering frequencies and messing around with the, the the sort of resonators and such like um i think yeah absolutely and so we've been working with the the, the human in the loop we've been assembling fragments and that's one way of looking at music composition and performance and improvisation yeah um at the same time those uh, colleagues of ours who have been studying computational creativity have been doing a different thing which is not about having the humans in the loop no um it's about whether you can tell the difference as to whether this piece of music was created by human or machine. Actually, I've got a picture of that. Um, here we are. So this was uh, the Vortex Jazz Club in, in Dalston back in 2016. And a colleague of ours, Geraint Wiggins, um, had organized an event with his, his colleagues, which involved human performers um, performing a series of, of pieces of music where um, for each composer, in quotes, um, they would do um, two human composed pieces and one computationally composed piece. And in the audience, we sat there with our pens and questionnaires and we had to tick the box to say which we thought was human and which we thought was machine. It's really, really interesting exercise. And I think from a, a science viewpoint, probably we shouldn't have been looking at the performers because you get clues um, from the expressions on their faces <laughs> as to whether it's a familiar piece of music. Or not, and also whether the music was, was you know, very consciously written to be performable. <laughs> so um, probably by sitting in the front row, I had a, a few more signals to tell the difference. But it was, it was very impressive, and the, you know, lots of people got the wrong answers. I suppose that's the, yeah. the, there's a moral to that. Uh, interestingly, um, the, the, the things that stick in my mind about that evening, um, there's this piece called Daddy's Car, which you can find on. YouTube by Benoit Carey, working with Francois Pache, who's a, a colleague of ours, amazing guitarist. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, just, it's a good example of some pop generated with AI and, uh, you know, by, by training on, on Beatles. Again, I was sitting in front of Benoit Carey when he was performing that and, 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 and watched him do some of those chord changes, but you know, he did them very well. So we're beginning to get more human interpretation there of what the, what the AI has done. And then there's our colleague, Mark Dinverno, and goldsmiths uh, and mark's view is the quote even if you don't think machines can be created by themselves they can potentially be creative friends you can imagine a situation when you're having a conversation with a machine offering prompts as a critical creative accomplice and it's that human in the loop conversation i i would really emphasize yeah. the word co-creation yeah which is where most of my work has been so there's quite a, two distinctive strands of work here there's the penny tail with its human or machine which a lot of AI researchers sort of go into that because they have a clear success criteria. And then there's this, this world that Mark's hinting at here, which is, yeah, you know, human. what does it mean to be the creative human living with AI? And I think that's a really important question. Yeah, I think it's, I think what's really interesting about that is I think we, we did write a very short paper a while ago, like this sort of angel on my shoulder kind of yeah. metaphor where, the, where the, the artificial intelligence bit is an extension of yourself, really. But it's suggesting things that perhaps you could never imagine. So some of those things that it imagines, like like Dave alluded to earlier, is, are like for they might not work. So so when you're playing, I mean, I I play classical guitar a bit, but but when you kind of look at um, some notation and it says play sort of eight notes at once, well, you kind of can't do that on a six string instrument. So there's there's something that composers can can add to the mix they can kind of make things more human and more playable and design perhaps des, des design for performance um on the other hand sometimes some of the work that that i've written which which we'll put links to up later or add them at the end of the video it's it's not designed to be played by humans it's designed to be played as a tape piece so it's a performance piece it's not necessarily performed uh, by people live the the pieces is designed to be played but people that i know think it's orchestrated in a way because it sounds like an orchestrated piece but but that was the idea behind it how do you work with tools that are predominantly um do lead you to sound 
like you're creating digital music when you don't want to create um, music that sounds digital. So, so how do you orchestrate using using these sorts of systems that might give you, might might lead you or always give you um, a kind of electronic feel that's like kind of sterile, yeah. leapy. Um, and I think that's that's like any tools that you use, really, isn't it? If you're if you're using Max MSP or you're programming in Java or even if you play a violin or a banjo or you're a singer, you're kind of confined. So being able to take something, whether that's noises or whether it's notes, pitches, the length of the pitch, sequences of notes, and feed them into something as data, push a button and have something feed back to you that you then navigate in order to reuse. And you're not necessarily gonna use what the system outputs, but it might give you ideas. In, in the way that we perhaps op open a book, a music book, or I don't know, you get your bass out, Dave, and you play a few notes <laughs> and I say, hey, hold on, let me get my guitar, let's kind of work something up. So. No, I, I completely agree. That just describes the, the co-creation very well. And um, I know you described this before, is we're, you're kind of navigating the latent space. I think that's a really good way of looking at it. Uh, PhD student at um, the Royal Northern College of Music, uh, Robert Laidlow, uh, has created some contemporary classical pieces of music with AI about AI. I think quite distinctive at that. Um, one, one of the pieces which we can share a link to yeah. uh, is where he trained the AI in his own work. Then he would prompt it and it would respond and then he would respond back to that. So it absolutely was a conversation. Uh, one of the movements is yeah. a conversation. But this this use of AI, this fashion now where um, we're seeing some you know, lots of People like to train on Bach and or Chopin and demonstrate they can produce music that's like Bach or Chopin. We've actually been doing music and AI for forever, as far as I, I'm concerned. I mean, I was first involved in, I'm a Lisp programmer. I was involved in AI uh, back in the 80s. And um, uh, I, have a, I have a quote. Let me share this. <laughs> um, so I think we should all mention George Lewis more often. So if you read the text on the left here, he's describing a system called Voyager, non-hierarchical interactive musical environment that privileges improvisation. In Voyager, improvisers engage in dialogue with a computer-driven interactive virtual improvising orchestra. The computer program analyzes aspects of the human improviser's performance in real time, using that analysis to guide an automatic composition, or if you will, improvisation program that generates both complex responses to the musicians playing and independent behavior that arises from its own internal processes. So doesn't that describe the sort of thing we're talking about now and that we might be aiming to do tomorrow? But the point is, this software was written in the 80s. You can see a program on the right there, the performances of Voyager back in 86. So really we have been working on this for a very, very long time. Yeah, I think as well, it's interesting that he he puts the system down, doesn't he, as the sort of computer performer. Yeah. So I think as, as well, I think now, I think I'm sure about this, that um, he can, um, yeah, so so Voyager now runs as like a max MSP patch. Yep, that's right. And he, put, he can play with his trombone in order to sort of kick it off. And that starts playing against him. He, he can plug it into sort of one of the, I don't know, I call it one of the Yamaha intelligent pianos. Uh, I can't remember what the name is, but um, uh, I almost said pianola, but uh, that would well. be from the past, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it is, but yeah, people have been experimenting with pianolas in the past, haven't they? Which, I mean, the, the group can talk about afterwards. But yeah, it, it, George, George Lewis fascinates me because um, I think it's, he, I mean, you have to correct me if I'm wrong, but he, he seems to come from a tradition of um, improvisation. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so when he starts playing, um, the system starts to play, not against him, I would say, but with him. And then he starts playing with that and it triggers different things or the stops or, 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 or and he carries on or he stops and it performs. And he's, he's a really, really interesting and very, very articulate person. He's kind of good to listen to because he, he very much um, crystallizes ideas 
um, more more in terms of I think as an ethnographer in some some ways. So I think the last thing that I saw, he was discussing four different ways of um, understanding improvisation. Um, and any sort of this, I don't know, he's got, he talks about the choices that are made and an agency. Um, I kind of, I've, I've got a few more things and that, that I, I think are important. Um, but, but for his stuff, he's doing it in the moment the system it's very much um you know all this stuff's being done he's, he's an expert he's kind of he's there he understands how to improvise it becomes a performance and a composition and he, he's kind of on on the verge he's on the edge isn't he? he's 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 there doing it at that very moment um except there's like hundreds if not thousands of hours of programming gone into developing <laughs> that system i know sorry i was, I was going to say yeah. with with my stuff i'm very much based on um, Dave's ideas and prob probably George Lewis's as well. I've, I've got a workflow where I write something, notate it, I, I stick it in Dorico, which I usually you might use Finale or something else. I then import that into Ableton. I then use some AI tools. I use Google Magenta, and then I start to experiment with that. So I can I can make things sound like uh, music that I've already written but I can mess around with the probability and I can make it sound nothing like I've written, but, but then I can go back and, and choose little pieces out of um, the suggestions that are made by the machine based on my work and a bit like Rob feed it back in if I want to. Um, but I, I know that I was listening to, to you, Dave, a talk with um, Emily Howard the other day and I was fascinated with some of the stuff they were working on the Royal North, Northern College of Music and it's George's stuff is in the moment. My <laughs> stuff takes, you know, a few minutes. It <laughs> can take longer to record, but but that stuff seemed to take hours and hours. Yeah, Would you like to... yeah I can I can say something about that. Um, what what is what exactly is Prism? Prism is um, the Centre for Practice and Research in Science and Music. Um, it was founded a few years ago now um, by Emily Howard, Rosa, um, Marcus Azotoy, and and myself. So Marcus is a mathematician from Oxford. Yeah. And um, then we had some funding from um, Research England. Uh, so we set up a lab. So, so one of the answers to what is PRISM is that it's a lab. Yeah. Um, we have many um, students um, of all sorts of different kinds uh, involved with it at the Royal Northern. And also we have visiting artists and scientists and writers. And we're absolutely addressing this. And we have a research software engineer. So uh, what his name's Chris Meelan. Um, you can hear him on a recent podcast we'll provide a link to that but um he he took a published algorithm um sample rnn we created our own implementation of that uh, which was easily accessible to um the community who wanted to use this came back to your point earlier alan these things have to be accessible and usable um and what sample rnn does is train it's working at audio sample level rather than note level i'll come back to notes but um, so you train on audio, you have to chunk it up, train it. Some of those training sessions um, are running on, you know, they're two rather warm machines in the lab. Um, and we also use GPU clusters that are available, um, you know, remotely. Um, those sessions can run for, for days or weeks. And um, we've got quite good at understanding how to do that and how to understanding how to tune the algorithms in order to get some interesting things back. And it's those interesting things back that then prompt the composers perhaps to use them or perhaps to um, notate something that is is inspired by what the what the AI has done. And online you can find some sort of sample RNN outputs based on training on um, Beethoven, for example. Um, it's quite they're quite provocative creative inputs. Uh, and lots of training is involved. Now the other world in um, Prism is working at note level. And largely, this is what Robert Laidlow did earlier on. This is what we were, we were all doing earlier on. Um, and it's a bit like using AI for text. I mean, whether it's a text or whether it's a MIDI, whether it's a word or a MIDI event, essentially these things are getting mapped down to numbers in a neural network. And we, we were then two or three years ago using approaches like LSTM in order to um, train the neural network and then prompt it and it would generate some more output. Um, and that's the sort of cycle that Rob was in when he was doing his early composition work. 
is a piece called Alter, um, which was performed at the Barbican in 2019. Um, actually, let me show you a picture of that. So, so basically, with, with the sample-based system, what you're doing is taking chopped-up audio, feeding it into the AI, and then that feeds back a series of combinations of that audio yeah. that you can then listen to and you can navigate through. At note level, it's feeding you back. You're feeding it a series of notes and sequences and pictures, and it's analysing each one of those and the sequences and then feeding it back, I suppose, almost as some sort of score. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, here we are also being performed at the Barbican. We've got the written symphonia. Um, the objects on the left is the Lovelace engine, which is inspired by the um, the Babbage and the Zickle engine. That's, a, that's another talk. Um, this is interesting at many levels. And um, the AI, you know, it, it's composed with AI, about AI. At one point, the uh, mezzo-soprano sings a duet with herself, where the, the self she's singing with has been processed by AI. Um, but I wanted to mention the, the text as well, because at this stage, the, the approach we were using, um, 2019, to the, the music generation was really at note level. And the, um, we used very similar approaches to generating the text, generating the libretto that was being sung in this. Um, I'll just show you this picture of how that was done. There's quite a lot, a lot of sort of AI points to make here. So again... Back to where we started, Lovelace and Babbage. So we took the correspondence between <laughs> Lovelace and, and Babbage that is on deposit in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Um, many biographers have transcribed parts of this, including our colleague um, Ursula Martin. And um, we use that to train uh, an AI, like a ghost Ada Lovelace. You could prompt it with a, a line and it would ghost Ada Lovelace would respond with another line and so on. Um, but the trouble is when you use the standard AI, AI models, that are available online. They've learned their language model from, you know, for example, Reddit or Wikipedia or yeah. everything they can possibly find, which is not the language of Ada Lovelace. So we built a 19th century language model based on um, uh, correspondence because we're using letters, uh, also held in the Body and Library in a collection called Electronic Enlightenment. They very kindly shared their data to, to us for, for training. Um, and so we had, uh, in some senses, um, more realistic. I don't know what we mean by that word, <laughs> Ada Lovelace. Um, and we did some time travel and we did use some 21st century AI as well. Um, there's a whole load of interesting things in here. Um, this is working with text, the same issues um, arise with music, because once you've uh, taken some content and trained on it and you have a thing, yeah. um, wh what are the rights of use of that thing? where's the intellectual property what's the copyright situation and so on and this diagram you see here has been examined by copyright experts and everything seems to be fine yeah. but it is an interesting question as to who owns what and when in a in a workflow like this but it's, it's also i don't know i mean it does this make you think of I, what i've tried to do in the past is that for me it doesn't really matter whether it's note level or audio sampling that you're doing it's that you get something come back and you can um, mold it or explore it or the beauty about getting midi back is that you can add your own sound to it and that you can make things sound based on if you want a cello to play it or somebody to sing it or you want heavily distorted guitars or you you can create your own ambience based around um that that note level structure i think i think it's quite difficult when you get a sample back and then you think mm, it's, it's a sample which has been played and you almost get less control over it in some way. So for me, I like to have that um, constant, I like to have control over things, you know, it's, <laughs> that's just the way it is. It is a, I like to spend a long time doing things. Whereas I, I, I can imagine, um, I suppose on, on another project that I'm working on, the um, trustworthy autonomous systems, what I was discussing with, with somebody about, um, um, for example, robots that could could listen to the ambient sound or could listen to performances, and then the intelligence system could feed you back chunks of that, and then you use those chunks to perform with in the moment. So there are all kinds of interesting things that you can do there. But th but then again, it do it does feel I don't know how you feel about this, but it, it it does feel again like some sort of improvisation, and that I know that the, the 
I'd use the word affordance as a musical instrument. It's like with the guitar, which have got frets and strings on it. And you have to place your hands in certain places and uh, certainly trombones where, you you know, there's the certain lengths that you use to kind of create uh, various notes or harps or each one of those has got restricted somehow, but also up, offers opportunities with these sorts of systems. We, I don't, I don't know what you think, Dave. We don't really know what the opportunities are yet. No, I, I, I completely agree. And um, uh, it's really good to talk about affordances and ask ourselves questions about the affordances of these systems that we're creating. And as you say, a creative you know, response to being given an instrument with some affordances is to use those, but also to try to break them and explore the edges. And, um, and you know, these, these are hugely important discussions. And it really, uh, this is probably what music has to say to people who are doing AI research, because I am worried that people are sitting at at workstations and testing their excellent algorithms with their ex excellent statistical methods and demonstrating that this is nearly as good as a human or better, um, and not thinking about the thing we mentioned earlier, living in the moment with the AI. So um, I think robots are a really good example, but AI pervasively deployed in our buildings, our homes, our vehicles, our bodies, yeah. Um, that's that, yeah, that, that discussion needs to be occurring. AI researchers need to be thinking about the affordances of the AI and the interaction. Um, uh, there's a provocative, um, phrase, which is, um, AI is too important to be left with computer scientists. <laughs> so oh, I, yeah. I hope the computer scientists respond to that provocation by demonstrating that some really good HCI can help us a lot here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I, I completely agree with that. I mean, I, I was um, I had a chat with um, Doug Eck and Ben Laurie from um, from Google Research, yeah. and one of, one of the interesting things that Doug said he, I can't remember who he was talking about. I think it was a band called Yacht, who use a lot of um, artificial intelligence in their work, and it was like they'd created the album cover, I think lyrics, I think the mm -hmm. music. I don't know whether they'd done some. So there are different sorts of AI where perhaps you could. Um, merge um sounds together so you might have the sound of a bee um a very expensive house or acoustic guitar and a sort of steinway piano and you you can merge them together to create new sounds but i think this the the the, the band's what would you call it i don't know aesthetic was not to alter anything that the ai had offered so they'd obviously had to edit stuff, but I thought, yeah, that's a really interesting way to think, think yeah. about because how do you, I, I suppose nowadays you, you think, how do you notate um, for performances like the ones that we're kind of alluding to where we don't really know what's going to be performed when well, we've got some idea and we're trying to control it and it's, it, it's, it's hard to know because it's kind of, some of it's the stuff's in the moment and you know that people have to attune to using those tools, which are amazingly important for improvisers. And, and at the same time, you're kind of, you're getting technologists at, that are composer and stand about music, such as us, where we're thinking, hold on, this, th this interesting space that people are playing in where they can improvise and use these tools. Well, actually that in, I think George Lewis says a similar thing. It, it does inform other areas. So improvisation is not just something that relates to music. It's also something that relates to like, healthcare or relates to um, writing or getting out of a scrape or repairing your car. So, so is, is there anything that, that, that arguably you might learn from, from using these sorts of tools in a musical context that we can then apply to other domains? Yes, I think it's, it's, it really is a two-way street. Um, we're, we're adopting some technologies um, but equally, we have a lot to say uh, about the use of those technologies. You know, that sounds like there's just two, two, two things happening in opposite directions, but there's something else going on here. We're constructing something new. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, I, I suppose you, you could argue this at any point in, in history, that somehow the technology has affected the sort of the, the genre of new music that's occurring. But what we've just been discussing is a genre of music uh, involving AI. Um, yeah. and, and various little quirky aspects of that are already kicking in and people are using them, even human composed <laughs> compositions, yeah. because there's a new thing appearing. That one, one of the things about this that I find fascinating is that um, I, I don't know. I mean, perhaps people in the 
in, in the audience know, know more about this than, than I do. But one thing that scares the hell out of me is free improvisation. <laughs> and I, I mean, recently, when I've been messing around with some of, some of the AI tools, it's what I've been doing is um, experimenting and doing some free improvisation and then feeding that into the system yeah. to then work with that. And I've got this approach where you've got some stuff which is in the moment mm. and then you've got some stuff which is heavily worked upon and you bring these two things together and you sort of almost layer. So you've got layered improvisation where you're, you're, <laughs> you're bringing in in the moment stuff with very, very controlled um, composed stuff as well. So I, I don't know where this is leading me, but it's, I think sometimes it's nice to work in an area that, that kind of scares you a little bit. I think it's a really, really good point. And in a way, what we're doing with AI is embro embracing the disruption. And that's yeah, leading yeah. to new creativity. Here's that George Lewis quote. Um, so first of all, this one addresses some of the things we've mentioned. But we've been talking about, is it human? Is it machine? Is it co-created? And he's recently made the point, thus it's come to pass not only that improvisations by creative musical machines are often indistinguishable from those by yeah. humans, but also they need not be so distinguished. And, and I think that this is very helpful for me because I think I've come to that conclusion slowly yeah. um, uh, that we make all this fuss about which is which. Um, we discussed the different ways of doing it you know, as, as we've been talking about it. But actually, as we were just saying, in the end, you've constructed this, you've, you've created this new thing this new genre if you like this new content and, it, and it's interesting it's drawn it, but you don't worry about it and then then you're in the moment point again lewis points for interesting improvisation technologies so the mars robot the problem of the self-driving vehicle driving is basically a kind of improvising yeah it's always felt that much could be learned from the efforts to get computers to improvise music so it's that point how do we take this discussion back to all our colleagues in ai and computer science and technology and say look Actually, we know how to tackle some of these things that are really important. But there's much else to say, though. You know, I no. think we've done quite a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. So, no problem. So we, I think there's going to be a bit of a panel or some questions afterwards. So, um, so there you go. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you, Alan. <laughs>